we return all the glory back to you, Father. We worship you, Lord. For there is none like you. You are the most high God. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning and the end. You are the first and the last. Lord, we worship you. The God of all flesh. The Father of all spirits. We worship you tonight. And we ask tonight, O oh God, that may our worship, our praise, our thanksgiving be acceptable unto you, Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Blessed be your holy name. For in Jesus' mighty name we have worshipped. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you do me a favor and welcome someone to church this evening? Welcome someone to church this evening. Probably someone that you've not seen in a while. You could just welcome the person to church. We also welcome those of us, our brethren, our online brethren, watching us from the different parts of the world. We acknowledge that you are with us. We recognize you and we welcome you to church this evening in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, once again, it is a privilege and um, an honor to stand before the church of Jesus Christ to bring the word of God to us tonight. I just want to express my gratitude to our father, our daddy, Pastor Fred, for the opportunity given to me once again to stand before you this evening. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are we glad to be in the presence of God? You seem a bit cold. Are you cold? Are you cold? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Okay. I want to ask us this question tonight. What do you do for a child or a spouse, for those of us who are married, that makes you happy? What do you do for a child or a spouse that makes you happy? Is there any extent you cannot go to ensure that he or she has all that he needs? I mean, that child that makes you happy, that child that makes you proud. And for those of us that are married, the spouse or die your husband, die your wife, that makes you happy. Is there any extent you cannot go to ensure that he or she has all that he or she needs? I want to believe that this is more or less like a rhetorical question. Because I already know what, I can already guess what your answer would be in the circumstance because a child that makes the father happy is always at the heart of the father. In other words, the father always thinks about what he can do 
for the child. Why? Because the child makes him happy. Same principle is applicable in our relationship with God. He is our father. The scripture tells us, he said, I shall be a father to them and they shall be my sons and my daughters. In other words, in our relationship with God, he is our father and we are his sons. We are his daughters. Now the question is this. Is there anything that you think that God cannot do for his son, for his daughter that makes him happy? I believe that your answer will be in the affirmative. You will agree with me that there is absolutely nothing that God cannot do as a father for a son or for a daughter that makes him happy. And the same thing is applicable with our relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that the bride has made herself ready. So in our relationship with Christ, Christ is the bridegroom. While we are his bride. So is there anything that you think that a father cannot do for his son or a husband, a groom cannot do for his wife that makes him happy? Absolutely nothing. A child that gladdens your heart, that makes your heart rejoice all the time. You would definitely want to go out of your way to make that child happy. I can imagine a parent at a graduation ceremony that is um, for an academic institution. The parent is seated there and it is the time to reward those of them that have worked hard. And they keep calling this particular child best in mathematics. Okay, okay, John. As the child is coming forth to collect the award, all eyes are on the child. As the child picks up the award on his way back to his seat, another announcement goes forth best in English. Okay, okay, John. He runs out again, he picks the prize. As he's about getting to his seat, another call is made best behaved student. Okay, okay, John. The child comes back. What do you think will be happening to the heart of the father of this child? He will be very, very excited. He will be happy. He will be proud. He will say, behold my son who has made me proud amongst parents. Do you think that when it is time to pay school fees, let's assume that this particular parent or this particular father has nine children and it is time to pay school fees. But the father or this parent could only afford to pay for one person. Who do you think the father will pay for first? He will pay for OKK John. Why? Because OKK John makes him happy. He can say, this one, I am pleased with this one. And he can go to any length. Even assuming that he does not have the money to pay. You would agree with me that he will go borrowing. Just to make sure that he pays the school fees of this particular child. Why? 
because he makes him happy. He makes his heart rejoice. He makes his heart glad. Any man that makes heaven happy or that makes heaven rejoice is a cherished treasure. And heaven always mobilizes her resources to ensure that every single need of this particular son is met. No wonder Apostle Paul said, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Heaven supplies all of his needs or needs according to God's unlimited resources. Why? Because this is a son. This is a special child. This is a special son. The angels are mobilized on behalf of this one. Heaven opens up its armory in a situation where there is an attack from the kingdom of Satan. Heaven has an armory. It will be opened. Why? Because there is a special song that is in danger and heaven must respond. Because this particular song makes heaven rejoice. This particular song makes heaven glad. Acts chapter 13, 21 to 22. Acts 13, 21, 22. Verse 21 says, And afterward, they desired the king, and God gave unto them Saul, the son of Cis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. Verse 22. He says, and when he had removed him, who did they remove? They removed Saul. Why did they remove Saul? God removed Saul. Why? Because Saul disobeyed God. Saul preferred sacrifice than obedience to God. God gave an instruction God gave a command to Saul and he defied God's commandment. In fact, he went as far as consulting a medium and this angered God. This displeased God and because of that, God removed him. And when God removed him, Let's read on. He says, he raised up unto them. Who? David. To be their king. There was a reason why God removed Saul. We have seen the reason. Now we are going to see the reason why God chose David. He raised up unto them, David, to be their king. To whom also he gave testimony. In other words, David, God had a testimony concerning this, his son called David. He says, to whom also he gave testimony and said, this is God speaking. He said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. In other words, as far as God was concerned, David was a special son. David was special in the eyes of God. David was special in the sight of God. Why? Because David fulfilled all of God's will. That was why God chose David. Because David was a man after God's own heart. A man that fulfilled all of God's will. So David was special in the sight of God. That was why when he removed Saul, he raised up unto them another called David who would do all of 
his will. That was why God chose David. And like I said when I started, this man called David because he was special to God. Because he was special to God in the sight of God. He was special. Because he had a place in God's heart. God could do exceedingly, could do mind-blowing things for this is special son. If we are going to look at some of the things that God did for David in Psalm 23 from verse 1. Remember I said that there is no extent, there is no length that a father cannot go to protect and to preserve the life of a special son. The one that gladdens his heart. The one that makes his heart happy. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In other words, as far as David was concerned, he never lacked. He never lacked. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. A David in an economy such as ours, definitely he will not bother whether a, do, a, a, a dollar is equivalent to 2,000. He will not be bothered. He will not be bothered about the price of petrol. He will not be bothered about the, a bag of rice, the price of a bag of rice. I understand this 80, 85, 90. A David will not be bothered. He will not be bothered. A David will not be bothered whether or not the prices of things have gone high. He will not be bothered. Why? As far as he is concerned, the Lord is his shepherd. He said, I shall not want. I will never lack anything good my God will provide it. Anything good, my God will supply it. In verse 2, in verse 2, he says, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Verse 3, he says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Verse 4, this is talking about security. He says, yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. In other words, as far as David was concerned, his security is guaranteed. And that is what happens to God's special children. He provides security for them. If you read the book of Psalm 91, you will see that an average believer is entitled to an angel. Not to talk of the one that has a special place, that occupies a special place in the heart of God. In other words, when others are having an angel, one angel, that one is assigned 10, 20 of angels. Why? Because he or she occupies a special place in the heart of God. He occupies a special place in the heart of God. And heaven will do anything possible to preserve the life of such one. Why? Why? Because he is special. She is special in the sight of God. Now the secret weapon of the men of God. Of the men that God used in the Bible time and in history. There is a secret weapon. That this man had. 
And that secret weapon is that God was with them. They were able to accomplish all that they could accomplish because God was with them. And because he was always with them, that is why when you read and study the scriptures, you will see in multiple places where God says, fear not. Why is he saying fear not? Why is he saying to them, fear not? He is saying to them, fear not, because he is with them. God cannot be with a man, and that man will be scared, will be afraid. It is impossible. God cannot be with a man, and that man will be afraid. It is impossible. We saw it in the lives of the patriarchs. We saw it in the life of Moses. We saw it in the life of Joseph. We saw it in the life of Gideon. We saw it in the life of Jeremiah. We saw it in the lives of these mighty men. They were able to accomplish all that they accomplished. Why? Because God was with them. That was one of the, that was the secret weapon that they had. God being with them. And they knew that as far as God was with them, they had nothing to fear about. Nothing, absolutely nothing. They have absolutely nothing to fear about. We saw that, let's look at Moses. In Exodus 3, from verse 9 to 14, you will see that when God called, commissioned Moses on the assignment of the deliverance of the children of Israel from captivity, from Pharaoh, from the hands of Pharaoh. A conversation ensued. He says, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Verse 10. He says, Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Verse 11. He says, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? In other words, as far as Moses was concerned, that assignment requires somebody else and not him. Why? Because you cannot, who are you to confront Pharaoh? He has lived with Pharaoh. So he knew the capacity, the capability and the ability of this man called Pharaoh. So he knew that he wasn't qualified in any way for the assignment that God was giving to him. In verse 12, and he said, who said? Who said? God said. He says, and he said, certainly, I will what? I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. Verse 13. Moses had another concern. Because if Moses was going to go back to the children of Israel to tell them that he was the one that was going to deliver them from the hand of Pharaoh, they will look at him with disdain. They will look at him, Oh God, what are you talking about? Who are you? So because of this, Moses had another concern. He says, And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? Verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am, I am, hath sent me unto you. In other words, Moses had the backing 
of the Most High God. Let us look at the story of Jeremiah. You will see a similar thing. Jeremiah chapter 1 from verse 4 to 18. From verse 4 to 8. This was God commissioning Jeremiah for the assignment. He says, then the word of the Lord came unto me saying, verse 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Verse 6. Then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I am a child. Verse 7. But the Lord said unto me, say not I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. The story did not end there. Verse 8. He says, be not afraid of their faces. Can we read it together? Be not afraid of their what? Faces. Because I am what? With thee to deliver thee. Sayeth the Lord. The scripture that we just read in Psalm 23 verse 4 talking about David he says yes even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death he says I fear no evil for God is with me they all had the backing of the most high God that was why they could stand before men fearlessly that was why they could stand a Moses could stand before Pharaoh and address Pharaoh. Let's look at the man called Gideon in the Bible. Judges chapter 6, 11 to 16. He says, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat, and, and sat under an oak which was in opera that pertained unto Joash the Abizarite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianite. Verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Verse 13. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befalling us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord had forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. The next verse. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? The next verse. And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? How can I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. In other words, we are seeing the same thing that played out with Moses. Moses was literally saying, I am not qualified. For this assignment. This assignment should have been meant for somebody greater than myself. Because I am definitely not qualified. If you are looking for men to recruit that could deliver the children of Israel from Egypt. Look elsewhere. I am not qualified. It is the same thing that Gideon was saying. He said, how can you be sending me? He says, verse, go back to verse 15. That's where we are. He says, Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. In other words, who would listen to me? They will say, you. Where are you even coming from? Who are you? Who gave birth to you? Who born you? Who you? <laughs> and I am not only that my family is the poorest in the whole village, I am also the least 
in my family. So, Lord, this thing cannot work. It cannot work. In verse 16, this was God's, this was God's response. He says, and the Lord said unto him, surely I will what? Be with thee. And thou shalt smite the Midianite as one man. So all of this is a pointer to the fact that the men of the old, they had the backing of God. That was why they accomplished so much. If we read the book of Hebrews, you will see, you know, the list of these men and the things that they had accomplished. They were able to accomplish these things simply because God was with them. And the presence of God, just like pastor has said several times in teaching us on how to host God, he says the presence of God is a sign of approval. In other words, if you want to know whether what you are doing is approved of God, his presence will be with you. His presence will be there. So his presence is a sign of approval. It is not the anointing, but his presence. It is his presence that matters. It is his presence that makes the difference. It does not matter the situation. It does not matter the circumstance. It does not matter who you are facing. So long as you have the I am. So long as you have the most high God backing you. You are guaranteed. Victory is guaranteed. Success is sure. Is certain. And all of these men that I mentioned. They understood this. Especially Moses. He had a perfect understanding of this. That was why in Exodus 33 verse 2. God was telling him how he was going to send the angels ahead of him. Ahead of them. He said no. He says and I will send an angel before thee. I will drive out the Canaanites. The Amorites and the Hittites. And the Perizzites. The Havites and the Jebusites. This was God promising Moses that I will send an angel to accomplish all of this. But yet, Moses was not satisfied. Moses knew that with the presence of an angel, they could accomplish but a little. He knew that if God can go with them, they would accomplish the impossible. So, let's go to verse 15. This was Moses' response. He says, And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. In other words, we are not living here except your presence goes with us. Because he understood what it means that God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is with you. We also saw the same thing play out in the life of Jesus Christ. His ministry was filled with signs and wonders because of this singular reason. God was with him throughout his earthly ministry and one of the things that broke the heart of Jesus Christ while he was hanging there on the cross of Calvary was because the father had forsaken him he cried my God my God why have thou forsaken me that was the only time in history that there was a separation between Jesus Christ and the Father. Why? Because the Father could not behold iniquity 
at that point, the sin of the whole world was upon him. The guilt of the whole world was upon him. And the Bible tells us in the book of Habakkuk 1.13 that God is of a purer eye that he cannot what? Behold evil and cannot look on iniquity. It was at that point that there was a separation. But throughout his journey on earth, throughout his ministry on earth, God was with him. And this was affirmed in Matthew 3, 16, verse 17. During his baptism. He says, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This was an approval that God gave to concerning his son, Jesus Christ. That was why all the signs, he recorded signs and wonders, mighty things that John writes and said, if all that he did were to be written in a book, he says that there is no library on earth that can contain it. He accomplished all of those things. Why? Because God was with him. That was the singular reason why he could accomplish so much. Why? Because God was with him. Act 10, 38. Act chapter 10, verse 38. He says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Why? Because God was with him. Now, it is one thing for God to be with you. It is another thing for God to be with you always. One thing for God to be with you. It is another thing for him to be with you always. All of these men that we mentioned in the old, you would read in the scripture, the Bible will say, and the spirit was what? Upon me. The spirit was upon me. The spirit was upon me. So after a while, that thing lived. When God uses them to accomplish one assignment or the other, it leaves. And it comes back again. But from Jesus Christ, the Father was with him always. And that was why he could accomplish the mind-blowing things that he accomplished. We are going to see the reason why this was possible in the life of Jesus Christ. John chapter 8 verse 29. John chapter 8 verse 29. Can we read it together? And he that sent me is what? With me. The father hath not what? Left me alone. For I do always those things that what? That please him. This is the condition. If you want the father to be with you always. If you want God to be with you. The secret is that you must do always those things that please him. Jesus did always those things that pleased the father. That was why the father was with him. There is no promise of God like we have been taught. There is no promise of God that is automatic. 
No promise of God that is automatic. No promise of God. All of God's promises you have condition attached to them. So for you to claim a particular promise of God, you must fulfill the condition attached to that particular promise. Jesus said that he that sent me is with me. The father had not what? Left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. In other words, the condition attached to the father being with him was simply because he did those things that pleased the father. So to please him, pastor has taught us to please him is to delight in him. Delight means to be greatly pleased of someone. When someone is greatly pleased with you, that person delights in you. In other words, pleasing you is, the person sees it as his life. He sees it as all in all to make you happy, to do your biddings, even when it is not pleasant, even when it is not easy, even when it looks like a very difficult task, you will say no, for the sake of God, because I want to please him, I will go out of my way to do and accomplish this particular task because of the father. Why? Because he knows the implications of doing that which pleases the father. Which is that the father will always be with him. And because he knows that the father would always be with him, he is bold to confront any situation. He is bold to confront any challenge any circumstance at all regardless of what that situation is have you ever found yourself in a situation whereby it looks impossible it looks as though nothing could happen but when you remember the one that is with you when you remember the one that is living inside of you when you remember that the Holy Spirit is with you remember that the Holy Spirit is God that is the spirit of God when you remember that he is dwelling inside of you you remember that he lives inside of you you can confront any situation it does not matter what that situation is we saw that in the life of Jesus Christ a Lazarus was dead how many how many days four days Lazarus was dead four days Jesus he they told him and he was indifferent about it. He wasn't bothered. He continued preaching. They came to tell him, your friend Lazarus is dead. He says, don't worry. Let me finish ministry. Then I will attend to that. Four days, when he showed up in the scene, Martha began to weep. He said, Lord, if you had come, Lazarus, my brother would not have died. Jesus would have looked at her and smiled. He said, did I not tell you? I am the resurrection and the life. He did not begin 21 days of prayer and fasting. He did not kabash, no. He did not pray in the Holy Ghost. No. He only lifted up his voice and cried. He says, Father, I know that you hear me always. That was all. He says, for the sake of these people, Lazarus, come forth. And that was it. Why? Because God was with him. He knew 
that God was with him. And because God is with him, nothing is impossible. There is nothing that is impossible in the realm of God. There is nothing that is impossible. The Bible tells us that God called things that be not as though they were. There is nothing that is impossible. Nothing is impossible. And the one that is, that there is nothing that is impossible with him. When you realize that he is with you. <laughs> Why will you bother? Why will you be afraid? You will not be afraid. You will not fret. You will not be frightened. Why? Because you know that he is with you. You know that he is with you. And that you will confront that situation. You will confront that challenge. You will confront that circumstance. And that circumstance will bow. Because before God, there is nothing that is impossible. So he knew this. He operated in it. And he got the amazing results that he got. But what was the secret? He did all of that which pleases the father. That was the price that he had to pay to please the father. If you read Matthew 26, while he was at the garden of Gethsemane praying, in fact, that was the biggest battle that he fought before going to the cross. It was when he was able to subdue his will, to let go of his will, so that the will of the Father can be accomplished. That was when he had that victory. It was so difficult for him. It was so difficult. He said that my soul is overwhelmed. He said he was sorrowful. Can you give us verse um, Matthew 26? Verse, verse um, 37. The Bible says, And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to what? To be sorrowful and very heavy. The next verse. He says, Then saith he unto them, My soul is what? Exceeding what? Sorrowful. Even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. The next verse, 39. He says, and he went a little further and did what? And fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this what? Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but what? But as thou will. In other words, not my will left for me. I wouldn't have gone. I wouldn't have bothered. I wouldn't have wanted to do this. But because this is what makes you happy. This is what will please you. This, this is what will make you glad. This is what will make you rejoice. I let go of my will. Let your will be done. He did that which pleased the father. And that was why the father was always with him. So to please God is to delight in him. And when you begin to delight in him, all of your heart desires, he will grant them. Psalm 37 verse 4. Psalm 37 verse 4. He says, delight thyself also in the Lord. In other words, greatly please him. 
He says, and he shall what? Give thee the what? The desires of thy heart. How many of us have desires in our heart? What we want the Lord to do for us. You know, like I said earlier, the promises of God, they are not automatic. There are conditions attached to the promises of God. He says that when you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give thee what? The desires of your heart. It does not matter what that desire is. So long as it is in accordance with his will, he would definitely grant them. But the condition there is that you do what? You please him. When you please him, he will grant every desire in your heart. But the question is this. Can two work together except they agree? Can two work together except they agree? That is Amos, I think Amos 3 verse 3. Amos 3 verse 3. He says, can two work together except they be agreed? In other words, for you to please the Father, for you to please God, you must love what he loves and you must hate what he hates because two cannot work together except they agree. So for you to be able to please God, you must love what he loves and you must hate what he hates. We saw that in the life of his son Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 8. Let's read from verse 8. He says, but unto the son, he said, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Verse 9. He says, thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. In other words, for us to be able to please God, for us to be able to make God happy, for us to be able to make God rejoice, we must love what he loves and we must hate what he hates. You cannot be claiming that you are making God happy. You cannot say I am making God happy and you will hate what he loves. And you will love what he hates. It will not work. It will not work. For you to be able to make God happy you must love what he loves and you must hate what he hates. Concerning Jesus Christ, he loved righteousness. You know, God is righteous. He's a righteous God. The Bible tells us in the book of Jeremiah, I think verse 29, 4. Jeremiah 29, 4. No, the scripture I'm looking for is the scripture that says, um, is the scripture that says, um, let him that glory, glory in this. Can you help me find it? Um, Jeremiah 9.23. 9.23. Jeremiah 9.23. He says, Thus saith the Lord, this is the Lord speaking. He says, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. Verse 24. He says, But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise what? Loving kindness, judgment, and what? And righteousness. The kingdom of God is built upon righteousness. Any day that God ceases to be righteous, his kingdom will collapse. So his kingdom is built upon righteousness. His throne is upon righteousness. So for you to be able to please God, for you to be able to make God happy, 
It is the message of righteousness. You must love righteousness. Because that is the nature of God. You must be righteous. And unless you love righteousness. And what is righteousness? Speaking the truth from a pure heart. You will not tell lies. The Bible says, He that sweareth to his own heart and changeth not. Psalm 15 verse 1. Let's look at Psalm 15 verse 1. Psalm 15 verse 1. He says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Verse 2. He says, He that walketh uprightly and walketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Verse 3. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. Righteousness. Righteousness. To please God, you must love righteousness. And not only that you must love righteousness, you must hate iniquity. Because God is of a purer eye than to behold evil. And he cannot look upon iniquity. There are six things that God hates. Seven is an abomination. So when you are talking about the things that God hates, we have looked at the things that God loves. Righteousness. God loves righteousness. We saw that in the life of his son, Jesus Christ. He says, because thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. So there are six things that God hates. And seven is an abomination. Proverbs 6. We'll read from 16 to 19. He says, these six things that the Lord hate. Remember that we have established that for you to be able to please God, for you to be able to make God happy, you must love what he loves and you must hate what he hates. So you cannot say you are pleasing God and you will love what he hates. It will not work. So for you to please God, you must hate what he hates. And the things that he hates, you must hate. He says, these six things that the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination unto him. Let's look at them, verse 17. The first one there is what? A proud look. God hates a proud look. What does it mean? It means... When a man is such a person, he looks down on people. When you look down on people, who is like me? Because of your qualification. Because of the things that you possess. Because of the things that you have. Because of your academic qualifications. Because you have schooled in Harvard. You have schooled in um, Oxford. You have degrees. So when you look at people, you look at them with disdain. In fact, there are people that you cannot stay in their midst. In their midst. You look at yourself as someone who has achieved so much. The Bible says that God hates such a person. God hates such a person. Remember that the Bible says that God resists the what? The proud. He resists the proud. In other words, if you have pride in you, God will resist you because he hates it. He hates those of them that are proud. Those of them that are arrogant. Those of them that are full of themselves. Nobody can talk to you. You cannot sit where they down and out are seated. When you find yourself in the midst of the poor, 
you simply separate yourself. If it is in a church, you have a clique. You have this particular group of people that you mingle with, that you relate with. Why? Because these other people, no, uh, is it not brother this? Is it not sister that? No, I'm not in their level. Uh, uh, don't you know that based on my qualification, based on my status in the society, I cannot be seen with so, so, so and so person. He says God hates it. He hates a proud look. And the next thing that he hates is what? A lying tongue. He hates a lying tongue. Remember the Bible had already told us in Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 the candidates of hell. These are the candidates of hellfire. In other words, anybody that is found in this category, the Bible says that he or she will have his part in that lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. And one of the candidates that we can identify there, the Bible says, all what? All liars. In other words, God hates those of them that tell lies. So if you find yourself always telling lies, if you find yourself always misleading people, saying A when you meant B, defrauding people through your statement through your utterance God hates it and you cannot please God is very impossible and since you cannot please God he will never be with you and that promise that he made and said I will never leave you nor forsake you that promise is for those of them that please him. There's one song that we used to sing. I think it goes this way. He's with me always. He's with me all time. He's my loving friend. My savior all the time. He's with me always. He's with me all time. He's my loving friend. My savior all the time. Can we sing it again? He's with me always. He's with me all time. He's my loving friend. My Savior all the time. He's with me always. He's with me all time. He's my loving friend. My Savior all the time. In other words, it does not matter the situation. It does not matter the circumstance. It does not matter the mountain that is before you. So long as you have the assurance that he is with you always, you are calm. He says, be still and know that I am God. That can only be a promise for those of them that please him. Those of them that make him happy. Those of them that make his heart rejoice. They are the only ones that he is with always. So whenever you are faced with a situation, you are faced with a challenge, you are faced with a problem, that door seems to be locked. You seem to be alone in that place. You just sing the song. But you cannot just sing this song except you know that you please him. And how do you know that you please him? You love what he loves. And hate what he hates. You are not such a man that has a proud look. You are not such a man that lie. You don't tell lies. You don't deceive people. You don't mislead people. 
You don't see white and you call it black. You love righteousness. You love righteousness. I remember several times. There are several times I was, I was, someone employed me. Yes, let me use that word in quotes. The person employed me as a research assistant. So part of the, part of my um, assignment is to go online and look at materials that people had written, people had published, books that people had published. Now, when I feel so lazy, the next thought that occurs to me is just go and lift those things the way they are in the people's material and paste it on what I am doing or what I'm researching on or writing about so that, you know, my ogre will be excited. He will be happy because I will turn in the work on time. But the Holy Spirit inside of me, there will be a reaction. If you lift this thing, if you, they call it uh, plagiarism. If you lift this thing and paste it like that without referencing the person that did the work, is a sin. It's an act of unrighteousness. It's an act of unrighteousness. What do I do? I have two options. Is it that to continue researching, researching until I'm able to come up with my own thoughts or I must acknowledge them? Two things. So it is not actually easy to live a life of righteousness. If you really, really want to please God, you must travel the path of righteousness. And the Bible tells us that the definition of sin is what? All act of what? Unrighteousness. In other words, anything that is an act of unrighteousness is a what? Is a sin. It does not matter what that thing is. So long as that thing is an act of unrighteousness, it's a sin. If you copy someone else's work and claim to that it is your work, it's a sin. It's a sin. It, because it's an act of unrighteousness. There are so many things that we do today that are acts of unrighteousness. Even coming late to church is an act of unrighteousness. The Bible says that he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him is a what? Is a sin. And all act of unrighteousness is what? Is sin. So don't be deceived though. It is not easy. The Holy Spirit that is dwelling inside of you before you perform that act you bought a good for so, so, so amount. And you know that the fair price to sell that good should be X, Y, Z amount. And because you want to make excess gain, you add something more to it. It's an act of unrighteousness. It's a sin. Is a sin. Act of unrighteousness. Let's go back to um, Proverbs 16. Proverbs 6, 17. Yes, it says, And hands that shed innocent blood. God hates murderers. We just looked at Revelation 21 verse 8 that listed those of them that will have their part in that lake that burneth with fire and brimstone. He says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and who? Murderers. These people will never inherit the kingdom of God. They will never. He said, I hate a hand 
that sheds innocent blood. I think that includes abortion, isn't it? It includes abortion. Whether you were the one that did it or you aided the person to do it, you have shed innocent blood. God hates it. You will never please God. It is impossible. Why? Because he hates it. And he will not be with you. And this song that we sang will never be with you. Will, will never be for you. He says, and hands that shed innocent blood. Verse 18. He says, and hearts that devised wicked imaginations. In other words, inside of you, you are plotting on how you will harm your brother. You are plotting on how you will harm your sister. You are plotting on how you will make somebody fail. You are plotting on how you will get that person to be demoted. You are scheming inside of you. You are planning it. You are cooking it inside of you. What will I do to hurt him? What will I do to hurt her? He says, and heart that devised wicked imagination. You are plotting inside of you. You are scheming inside of you. You are not happy with that brother. You are not happy with that sister. And you are drawing up a plan inside of your heart on how you can hurt him, on how you can hurt her. The Bible says that God hates it. Then the next... He says, feet that be swift in running to mischief. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. In other words, you are only interested in the business of tail bearing. Whenever they say something, about somebody else. You are quick to go and report to the person. You are quick to tell the person, ha, ah, do you know what Ebuka said against you? Do you know what Pastor John said against you? Do you know what they said against you? Ha. Ah. And the person will ask, what did they say against me? You will say, ah, if I tell you this thing, in fact, you will not hear it from my mouth. He said, tell me now. He said, no, no, no. I don't want to tell you this thing. She wants to tell you or he wants to tell you. Because that's the whole essence of coming to you in the first place. He said, no, you will not hear it from me. He said, please now, please now. He or she will say, I don't want to tell you this thing. No. I don't want to tell you this thing. No. Or you promise me when I tell you, you will not mention my name. Your feet is swift in running to mischief. Say that God hates it. You want to go and gossip. You want to go and do the business of tail bearing. You, you, you join because the whole essence is to make party A to feel bad towards party B. You want to jam their heads together. It says that God hates it. He hates it. Another thing that God hates is divorce. It's clearly written. Malachi 2. Malachi chapter 2 verse 16. Okay, there is another one before we go to Malachi. Yes, please project the last scripture that you projected before now. He says, a false, what? A false witness, that what? That speaketh lies. A false witness that speaketh lies. A false witness. In other words, you lie against somebody who is innocent. 
you bear, it's not Mr. Innocent, you bear, you bear false witness. False witness. In my profession, this is most prominent. Why did I say so? If you have ever been involved in a police case and that police case is as a result of a petition that was written by a lawyer against you. You know, the police, they don't entertain civil matters. Okay? They only entertain criminal matters. So for them to entertain your petition, maybe somebody is owing you the person has refused to pay and all of that. And you run to the police. Police will clearly tell you that here we don't do debt recovery. We don't recover debt. If someone is owing you, just go to the court, sue the person and recover the money. Somebody say, however. Somebody say, but. This is what you need to do. Get a lawyer. So that he will twist the story. He will write it in such a way that an element of criminality will enter. Uh -huh. Then the police can boldly step in and will help you recover the money. Then you will approach a lawyer. You will approach a lawyer and you will tell the lawyer, this is his owing me he was supposed to deliver a car to me. He has refused to deliver the car after I've paid. The lawyer will say, eh, okay, okay. And we, there's a way we can cook it so that it can become obtaining by false pretense. Have you seen the name that I have given it to? Yes. Obtaining by what? By false pretense. It means that you are going to do some, you know, we are going to tweak the petition, tweak the petition, make it in such a way, you know, that it will be clear that he had an intention from the onset to defraud you. So we meet this always, every time. Why? Because you need to convince the judge you need to make the judge believe your case. You need, to, you need to make the authorities believe in your client's case. And so because of that, you have to tweak the petition, what you are writing, so that the story can rhyme. And as the story is rhyming, you are bearing false witness against an innocent person. Why don't you leave the case as it is. So, by the grace of God, what this has now resulted to is that we reject the brief. That's the option that you have. You know, people ask the question that, um, you know, they say, all lawyers are what? Liars. Have you heard something like that? And they will say, lawyers will never make heaven because they lie. Right? Right? Okay. Now, how you can avoid that is you, there is what we call cherry picking. Okay. You pick the case that you know that indeed you will do it in righteousness. And those ones that you cannot do in righteousness, you tell them that I cannot do this one. And guess what? Those ones that you don't do in righteousness. They come with a... Eh? In fact, when, 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 they will, when the brief will land like this, in fact, there was a, a, a particular case, you know, like the next one that we're about to treat is divorce. Okay? I don't do divorce matters. No matter what, however way you want to... So somebody called me from UK and said, John, I want to divorce my wife. I said, where is your wife? He said, my wife is in Nigeria. He's in the UK. He said, I want to divorce my wife. I said, okay. 
you have to pay consultation fee so that I can look at the case. You know, maybe because there could be a way out and all of that. He consulted me and paid consultation fee. And he was ready. He said, I will pay you whatever you want. So, I now asked him, is he on the basis of adultery? He said, eh, eh, maybe, maybe, maybe. I said, do you have proof? He said, he doesn't have proof. He said, why am I asking him all these questions? That he understand that in Nigeria, you can just, you know, file anything, cook up something and all of that. And guess what? He was ready to pay in good currency. Yes. He was ready to pay in good currency. But I had to turn it down. I said, no, I can't do it. You know? So, the juicy briefs, you will see temptation in them one way or the other. You know, but God has always been faithful. When he sees that your heart disposition is to please him, is to make him happy. I don't know how he does it. He will just orchestrate and, you know, arrange one land transaction, property transaction. You understand, right? You don't understand. <laughs> he, will, he will arrange one property transaction that will pay you good money as well. The same way somebody will call you from... UK or wherever to say I want you to do a divorce matter. That's the same way somebody will call you from there and tell you I want to buy a property worth millions of naira. Is God not good? Yeah. Act of righteousness is not easy but for you to please God so that he would always be with you in times of need, in times of challenges, in times of problems, you must live a life of righteousness. You must live a life of righteousness. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 22, 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, 1 John, can we read it together? And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his word, commandment and do those things that are what? Pleasing in his sight. So because we do those things that are pleasing in his sight, whatsoever we ask him, we receive of him. He says, delight yourself in the Lord. And I will give you the desires of your heart. Just make up your mind to obey every of God's commandments. Make up your mind to keep his commandments. See, there is no other way to be happy as a Christian apart from obedience. What's that song? Trust and obey. For there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Do you know the stanza? The, the Lord in the light of his word what a glory shares on our way when we do his good Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust. And he says, There is no other way, there is no other way to be happy in Jesus. The only way is to keep his commandment, is to do that which pleases him. Is to do that which makes him happy. 
That is why the Bible says in the book of Isaiah, he says, um, he says, what's that scripture now? Um, they that are obedient shall eat. If you are willing and what? Obedient, you shall do what? Eat the good of the land. There is no other way to be happy as a Christian. If you have not made up your mind to live a life of righteousness, it is frustration in this kingdom. Tell somebody, tell somebody beside you, if you have not made up your mind to live a life of righteousness, you will be frustrated in this kingdom. Didn't the Bible say that the kingdom of God is not about what? Meat or drink. But is about what? Righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's about righteousness. That's why people get frustrated when they come to Oak House Church and they keep hearing about righteousness, 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 righteousness. They will be complaining. Can't they teach another thing? Can't pastor teach another thing? The message is hard. The message is difficult. Can't we hear something about prosperity? Why? Because in this kingdom is about righteousness. It's not about any other thing. It's about righteousness. Righteousness, 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 righteousness. Because in so doing, we make God happy. We gladden the heart of God. And when he's happy with us, the resources of heaven are mobilized on our behalf. We can now say with boldness, that even though we walk through the valley of shadow of death, we fear no evil, for he is with us. That is when we can say that he will never leave us, nor forsake us. Why? Because he is with us. He has made that promise. But what qualifies you, the condition, is that you must live a life of righteousness. You keep his commandments. You delight in him. See, it does not matter who is pursuing you. It does not matter the number of enemies that you have in life. So long as your ways pleases the Lord, he will make even your enemies to be what? At peace with you. It does not matter how difficult that your boss is. It does not matter how difficult the people around you are. Just concentrate on pleasing the Lord. Just concentrate on pleasing the Lord. And he will make them to be at peace with you. As we close, let's take that song again. Trust and obey.
What a glory he sheds on a way. Our way to his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust, trust and obey, for there's no But to trust and obey. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you. The Bible says that you sent your word and your word healed them and delivered them from their own destruction. And your word says that we are clean by the word that you have spoken to us. Father, what we ask for today is grace. We ask for grace to obey. For there is no other way to be happy in this kingdom. There is no other way to be happy in Christ except by the way of obedience. Father, we ask that you give us the grace. The Bible says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Lord, we ask that you give us the grace to obey you. This is our desire to obey you, to delight in you, to love you, to keep your commandments. Thank you, Father. And Lord, even as we come to the communion table, on that night that you were betrayed, you took the bread, you broke it, and you gave thanks. And you gave it to them. You said, eat for this is my body that was broken unto you. In the same manner, you took the cup, you blessed it, and you said to them, take and drink. For this is my body that was shed for your sake. And you said, as often as you do this, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, just like the scripture says, that the bride has made herself ready. The scripture declares that the one that has this blessed hope in him, he purifieth himself. Heavenly Father, we ask that you help us. Help us to live a life of righteousness. Help us to live a life of holiness. Help us to live a life of purity. So that at the end of the day, we shall see your face. Because the Bible says that blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. Heavenly Father, help us. Help us to finish this race. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Blessed be your holy name. For in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. I am a child of God. And therefore, I am not a slave to sin, death, fear. The power of God flows through me. The grace of God works in me. The power of God helps me daily. As I go out, I walk in victory and I am established in Christ as an oak of righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.